coup, nous allons euh, enchaîner, si je puis dire, avec Reza Recher, Re Rexer, je ne sais pas comment on prononce votre nom, excusez-moi. Rexer. Rexer, ok. Oui, voilà. Alors, vous avez soutenu votre PhD euh, en français à Yale University en mai 19, euh, 2014. Et vous travaillez actuellement à un livre provisoirement intitulé « L'art d'exposition, la littérature et le nu photographique dans la France du XIXe siècle », dans lequel vous vous intéressez aux relations entre représentation littéraire et signification culturelle du nu photographique. Par ailleurs, vous exercez la critique d'art en freelance et vous enseignez le français à New York. Alors, vous allez faire votre intervention en anglais et c'était indiqué dans le programme et euh, notre sens de l'hospitalité proverbiale euh, à Paris, nous avons une sinistre réputation, donc nous allons faire un effort et, et nous vous remercions beaucoup et nous allons vous écouter avec attention. Merci. Et euh, avant de commencer, moi aussi, j'aimerais bien euh, remercier les organisateurs du colloque qui a été incroyablement fascinant de, de m'avoir invité et je vais ajouter que juste après l'introduction j'ai fait une petite traduction un résumé sur le chant en français comme ça euh, je vous donnerai quelques phrases en français et je crois que vous arriverez à suivre selon les images après j'espère alors on y va Emile Zola's 1880 novel Nana an intimate account of the life of a Parisian prostitute occasioned a critical tempest from the very moment its first chapters appeared in print. With Zola's characteristic unflinching naturalist precision, the novel recounts the titular heroine's rise and fall through every rung of prostitution, from destitute streetwalker to demi-mondaine in gory detail culminating with her gruesome death from smallpox. In reaction, horrified critics accused Zola in droves of fabricating the particulars of his courtesan's career and of exaggerating everything that was most revolting about human existence. There was one aspect of the novel's brutal realism that was particularly vexing for readers, Nana's naked body. Zola, reviewers complained, paraded Nana around in the nude, displaying her without so much as a wisp of clothing or a modicum of modesty. One reviewer sardonically suggested that, quand l'intérêt languit, tout à coup, Nana retire sa chemise. Taking their cue from the monarchist critic Armand de Pontmartin, who accused Zola of summoning toutes les contaries de la religion du nu et de la littérature pornographique, a whole host of reviewers accused Zola not simply of propagating a repulsive lie, but of producing pornography. Amongst the sea of accusations, there is one that stands out from the rest. Unlike those who compared Zola's novel to written pornography, the novelist Louis Ulbach saw a different erotic object in the pages of Nana. As he said in his review, je le répète, on ne fait pas un livre uniquement avec des gravelures, on fait un recueil pour servir de commentaire aux photographies défendues. Et je vous laisse lire la suite. Uh, in Ulbach's view, Nana is so lacking in narrative content that it cannot even be called a pornographic book. It is merely a collection of pornographic photographs strung together with the author's commentary. Ulbach's review highlights an interesting paradox. In fact, Nana resembles neither contemporary pornographic newspapers, which were filled with puns and scatological humor, nor pornographic books, which were filled with orgies, rape, and incest. But at the same time, Nana is always naked. And in this dominant presence of the naked female body, the novel does share much with contemporary photographic erotica and pornography. Ulvac, it turns out, was partially correct. As I will argue in the next 19 or so minutes, in the novel, Zola does appropriate the visual language of photography, uh, contemporary pornographic photography, to portray his heroine's body. But the result is not a titillating collection of photographs, as Ulbach suggests. Instead, Zola uses these images 
to buttress an indictment of contemporary sexual mores that extends far beyond the novel's explicit critique of prostitution. By portraying Nana as a photographic pinup, Zola links prostitution and pornography as two interconnected components of one economic system in which women's bodies circulate for sale in many forms, laying bare all of society's sexual hypocrisy along with his heroine's body Zola condemns not Nana herself, as many 20th century literary critics have claimed, but the men who consume the sexual commodities she embodies, both pornography and prostitution alike. Allez, petit résumé en français. Grande réaction contre le roman euh, Nana au moment de sa publication, et je vais montrer... Euh, Comment le roman fait allusion à la photo porno, mais je vais dire que ce n'est pas pour autant un roman pornographique, mais que ces allusions font partie d'une un, critique du système économique de la sexualité en France euh, et que Zola s'appuie sur ces photos pour approfondir sa critique de la prostitution. Oui et il va lier la prostitution et la pornographie à travers cette critique. Voilà. Uh, so, before discussing the novel, I'm going to take one step backward to talk about the kinds of images that Zola may have been referring to. Almost from the moment of photography's invention in 1839, photographers began to produce nude images. By the mid to late 1840s, some of the great photographers of the Second Empire, uh, Gustave Le Gray, Charles Nègre, Félix Moulin, uh, were already producing nudes. At the same time, painters quickly took to using photographs for their paintings. These kinds of photographs, known as academic nudes, were approved by the Ministry of the Interior for sale um, to artists, um, and many different artists used them. So as, as some art historians have noted, uh, Eugène Delacroix commissioned images from the photographer Eugène Durieux for some of his paintings. Uh, Courbet probably worked from photos of Julien Vallu de Villeneuve for his paintings L'Atelier and possibly for Les Baigneuses. And Jérôme commissioned an image from Nadar in order to finish his Friné devant l'Ariopage, which we have, Friné has come up many times during the conference. Following the invention of the inexpensive and infinitely more reproducible wet collodion paper print and small formats like the stereoscope and the carte de visite photo, a, a parallel industry of illegal erotic photography quickly sprang up in the early 1850s. Alongside these artistic images that I just showed you, there was a blossoming of obscenity on the streets of Paris. The first obscenity prosecution of a photographer took place in 1851. And just a few years later, so many images were being produced that the police began to keep a separate register to track their distribution, where they also preserved uh, many of the extant examples of these images. And you can see this same page upstairs in, in the exhibition from the register where they would record all the details about models and photographers and uh, distributors of these images. One police raid in the 1860s yielded over 4,000 prints and negatives. And just like academic nudes, these illicit images also began to influence the high arts. Gerald Needham, the art historian Gerald Needham, has argued that this scandal over Manet's Olymp Olympia Olympe, which is also on view upstairs in the exposition, um, may have been incited by the painting's references to contemporary photographic pornography. And a number of art historians have suggested that Courbet's infamous Origine du Monde was probably inspired by Second Empire pornographic photography. Je vous laisse pas regarder uh, <laughs> l'Origine du Monde pendant que je continue. Um, <laughs> pardon. <laughs> Um, the number of images only grew with the fall of the empire in 1870, the relaxation of censorship laws, and further technological advances in photography. So in 1892, the police arrested a photographer who had managed to distribute some 800,000 images in under three years. So the difference is from 4,000 images being distributed by one person in 1860 to 800,000, one person, 1892. 
Pornographic photography was ubiquitous throughout the Europe of the later 19th century, as much one of modern society's ills as alcoholism, poverty, or prostitution. It came well within Zola's purview as a writer and a social critic. Now, to return to Nana. Nana makes her entrance into Zola's cycle of novels on Second Empire life in his 1877 work, La Sommoire, a bleak tale of alcoholism amongst the Parisian working classes. As the novel bearing her name opens, Zola's teenage heroine has left the slums for life as a kept woman and is about to make her debut on the Paris stage. The novel's opening pages are littered with the verb voir, as male characters clamor for a glimpse of the mysterious Nana until finally the curtain rises for La Blonde Venus, the play in which she debuts. Je lis juste le début. Un frisson remue à la salle. Nana était nue. Elle était nue avec une tranquille audace, certaine de la toute puissance de sa chair. Une simple, une simple gaze l'enveloppait. Et... Nana certainly satisfies Paris's curiosity, for in the second act of the play, she takes the stage naked, but for a gauze tunic. And transparent gauze notwithstanding, in fact, all the more so because of it, this first description of Nana will determine the representation of her body for the rest of the novel. In his preparatory notes for this scene, Zola three times reminded himself that its purpose was not simply to introduce Nana, but to, quote, bien poser nana comme nudité. Zola here uses the word nudity in a very particular way, one that was common shorthand for photographic obscenity in the mid-19th century. It's a meaning of the word that is underlined by his reference to posing nana rather than presenting her. Nana, in other words, arrives not simply as a nude woman in her nudity, but as a nudity, opposed an explicit representation of the body. To render Nana in this way, Zola exploits the visual language of photography. He records every detail of Nana's body from sa gorge d'Amazone with its pointe rose to the blonde hair in her armpits with the meticulous precision unique to the photographic medium. Few women have painted hair uh, public pubic hair, excuse me, <laughs> in painted nudes, <laughs> but they do in nearly all nude photographs in the 19th century. Nana's downy fuzz is a convenient Freudian displacement upward for the more dangerous pubic hair that is so conspicuously present in contemporary photographic erotica. Moreover, her enticing transparent veil, which adds to her lore precisely by veiling nothing, is an extremely common prop in all kinds of nude photographs. So here are a pair. Uh, the one on the left is an illicit photograph also taken from the police register that's on view upstairs. And the one on the right is an authorized nude study uh, by Auguste Bollock that's in the uh, National Library Collections. Um, in yet another scene, uh, also produced by Auguste Bollock, uh, a woman stands delicately draped, taunting the viewer avec une uh, tranquille audace, uh, with her arms behind her head. And finally, a last image mimics Nana's scene even more closely, evoking a classical setting of La Blonde Venus with a lute and the placement of two women at the feet of a central figure. Nana's scene, in other words, is no reenactment of painted nudes, contemporary or otherwise. It marks the birth of a new kind of Venus, forcing readers to acknowledge that their contemporary Venuses were real women examined and desired through photographs. According to the art historian Abigail Solomon Godot, erotic and pornographic modes of representation are profoundly implicated with the structures of fantasy and thus involve a more or, a, or less elaborate staging of desire. Nana's theater debut is the literalization of the staging desire that occurs in such photos. In Zola's novel, the physical stage on which Nana appears takes the place of the photographic frame. If desire, however, is staged in pornographic photography, the very ontology of those images depend on the spectator. Accordingly, Zola, having posed Nana like an erotic pho photograph, then turns to this audience, whose desire is described in great detail. Et je dirai un petit peu 
peu à peu, Nana avait pris possession du public et maintenant, chaque homme l'a suivi. Des deux s'arrondissaient, vibrant comme si des archers invisibles se fussent promenés sur les muscles. Des nuques montraient des poils follets qui s'envolaient sous des haleines tièdes et errantes, etc. etc. Um, between the first uh, bouche irritée et sans salive and the, and the yeux de chat phosphorescent of the Marquis de Chouard at the end, the reader actually sees very little of Nana's body compared to how much we see of the male desire for that body. As each spectator reacts to her, an exhaustive compilation of symptoms of sexual excitement are thrust into the public space of the Théâtre des Variétés. Backs arch, hairs rise, goosebumps emerge. Breathing is altered. When we finally arrive at the ears of the young Dagonet, which saignait et remuait de jouissance, it is very clear that they are yet another Freudian displacement upward for a more scandalous body part. These men enact one of the primal fantasies of the pornographic image, that the naked woman exists only for the eyes of the men who behold her, even while hundreds or thousands of other eyes are doing the same. These eyes, glued to Nana as if to a stereoscope viewer, do more even than the staging of her body to insist that she is an erotic object. As the novel progresses, moreover, this opening scene is supplemented with others where Nana repeatedly reenacts contemporary erotic photographs. When Nana's various suitors disturb her in her dressing room in a state of semi-undress, it is as if they are walking in on one of the many photos of women dressing or undressing that were particularly popular stereoscopic images. I chose two. There are hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions. Um, Nana's lesbian relationship with the prostitute Satin has a counterpart in the vast array of lesbian-themed photographs produced in the middle and late 19th century as well. Uh, that one on the left as well as on view upstairs. Rather than becoming more of a human being over the course of the novel, Nana is again and again reduced to a photograph of herself. Some of these visual themes do also appear in situations of pornographic literature of the period. Most notably, Nana's lesbian affair with Satin has literary precedent, as, the one, as does one of the most infamous scenes in the novel in which one of Nana's lovers, the Count Mufa, watches her masturbate to her reflected image. Yet if masturbation exists in the literary record, once again Zola's execution is disconcertingly for photographic. First, he begins with a length, lengthy description of Nana's self-admiring antics taken straight from the visual repertoire of photography. Photographs of women admiring themselves in the mirror or with mirrors strategically arranged so as to reveal their backs while they still looked at the camera or vice versa are a staple of Second Empire and Third Republic erotica. In the mirror scene, the staging of Nana's body and the perspective of the viewer are uncannily similar to a series of 1856 photographs by Louis Camille d'Olivier. As Nana spends an inordinate amount of time absorbée dans son ravissement d'elle-même, studying the different parts of her body and trying out different poses so as best to behold her own splendor, it is as though she vivifies d'Olivier's still images fulfilling what is only potential in the photographs. She is like a primitive film reel, stringing together a series of erotic snapshots so that they emerge in time, rather than simply in the flat two-dimensionality of photosensitized paper. And finally, after this extensive photographic foreplay, the scene culminates with the description of Nana's auto-erotic satisfaction. As I just noted, the depiction of masturbation has some of the strongest ties to the tradition of written pornography. It appears in a number of works dating back to the 18th century. But in the history of visual erotica, the masturbating woman was a very new trope and one, one that had emerged with photography and was very closely associated with it, and it had innumerable photographic forms. As Zola shifts from self-admiration to self-pleasure, his technique remains just as photographic. Nana is meant to be looked at. From time to time, she pauses, as though to await her viewer's attention, 
under the transfixed gaze of her lover, every tiny detail of her body and the stages of her pleasure take shape in frozen poses orchestrated for display, up until the scene's climax. Even then, rather than leaving Nana basking in her afterglow, Zola again returns to the device with which he began the scene, the literally self-reflexive act of Nana looking at herself in the mirror, leaving her blowing kisses at her own reflection. Whatever Nana does, in other words, she always finishes as a photograph. The reader's experience of watching Nana look at and become a photograph of herself are brilliantly lampooned in a contemporary cover image of the satirical newspaper La Caricature from January of 1880. This is when debate over the novel had already begun to rage. In the drawing, Nana is pictured in her customary state of semi-undress, leaning over a strange machine that looks like a phonograph, but it also has an image of a woman attached to the top as in a stereoscopic viewer. The image has a caption. I will spare you the whole caption. It's very long. But it says, Chez Nana, so we know it's Nana, and the machine has a tag identifying it as a photophonographe. The satirical photophonographe participates in a running joke about the efforts of naturalist writers to capture reality, and the accompanying text focuses on sound recordings, but it also mentions that the photo machine will bring back the first accurate portrait of Nana, which is presumably the exact photograph that she herself is looking at in the image. Although it is funny, the cover of La Caricature illustrates a very serious consequence of Nana as photo photograph. When she looks at herself in the mirror, she acts as a pornographic photo and in her self-adoration, acts as the man who would be aroused by looking at such scenes. In other words, her masturbation is not the product of her own sexual arousal, it mirrors the desire of the men who look at her as pornography or as a prostitute. Nana is really nothing more than a photographic phantasm trapped performing the scenes of other people's desires never her own. The image of Nana leering at a photograph of herself also sheds light on long-standing debate over the socioeconomic ramifications of Nana's sexuality. For in the novel, her sexuality has very, very explicit class overtones. Just before the mirror scene, her lover Mufa reads a newspaper article in which Nana is described as a mouche d'or from the Parisian slums who has come to infect Paris. Quote, elle vengeait les abandonnés dont elle était le produit. Avec elle, la pourriture qu'on laissait fermenter dans le peuple remontait et pourrissait l'aristocratie. In the text, Nana's sexuality is inseparable from her lower class social status. And there is no question that Nana is a spectacular embodiment of working class revenge. The end of the novel is repeat with the lang replete with the language not of sexual but of economic destruction as she spreads financial ruin and runs through the fortunes of every single male character in the novel. Nana's lovers finish dead or bankrupt as she, quote, nettoyait un homme d'un coup de dent. For some critics, therefore, Zola's text expresses a misogynistic anxiety about the dangers of lower class female sexuality an anxiety that he can only assuage by subjecting his heroine to a gruesome death in which her formerly seductive body is rotted away by smallpox. That the ruin brought down by Nana is so explicitly financial, however, suggests that the economics of sexuality are just as much at issue as her sexuality as such. And indeed, in all her guises, as actress, prostitute, or photo, Nana is something more than sex. She is sex for sale. Pornography, the mass production of images for the economic gain of the producer and the sexual satisfaction of the consumer, stands at the convergence of sex and capitalist consumption. It is this convergence of sexual desire and economic power that is eating away at French society, not just sex. The market dynamics of sex in the novel, moreover, are not propelled by Nana, but by the men who have the money to consume her. And again, in his preparatory notes, Zola wrote, Nana, c'est la pourriture d'en bas, la ce moi. Se redressant et pourrissant les classes dans nous. 
Vous laissez naître ce ferment, il remonte et vous désorganise ensuite. This language echoes the novel but clarifies its perspective significantly. Rather than expressing anxiety about the destructive effects of working class sexuality, the text exposes the consequences of a social system in which the upper classes are satisfied that their economic power constitutes moral superiority and they leave those below to rot. Nano's photographic aesthetic, then, is only one part of the sexual economy denounced by the novel. After all, if she were not represented through photography, she would still be a prostitute who is, whose social trajectory is completely dependent on the men who offer her their fortunes to consume in one bite. The novel's photographic aesthetics, however, amplify this critique of prostitution by providing a constant and inescapable reminder that not, Nana is not a person, but a thing, a nudity passed from hand to hand and from eye to gawking eye. The allusions to photography are also a reminder of the growing entanglement of the two forms of sexual commerce that Nana embodies, and again, You can see a lot of this in the show upstairs. Um, from its inception, the pornographic photograph had been closely tied to the prostitution industry. Prostitutes modeled for photographs, and models were assumed to be prostitutes whether or not they actually were. By the time Zola wrote Nana, the pornographic photograph was increasingly integrated into the business of prostitution as a solicitation tool and as a secondary in income source for brothels. In Nana, the connection is even closer. Prostitution and pornography are equated not for these practical reasons, but because they are very fundamentally the same. They are two sides of a coin circulating in the same marketplace of female flesh. Whether the women on offer are paid for sex or sold as a simulacrum of themselves to man after man after man. In Nana's dual bodily identity as pornography and as prostitute, Zola draws the battle lines of a confrontation with the economics of the sexualized female body that is very much recognizable as an ongoing confrontation today. I'm finishing. For all these reasons, if Nana is nothing more in Ulbach's formulation than a compendium of commentaries on the erotic photograph, these commentaries constitute a scathing critique of French society. Nana is annoying, repulsive, oversexed, and lacking in any human nuance, but that is precisely the point. She represents a system of sexual relations that is equally lacking in its attention to individual humanity. Her sin was not in taking off her shirt for Zola's readers, but in implicating at them as she did so, holding up a mirror in which untold numbers of Zola's scandalized readers might see themselves and not her staring back at them. For Zola's contemporaries, it may well have been easier to decry his novel as, pornographic, as a pornographic lie than to acknowledge a truth about society, economics, and sexuality that was itself unpleasant and pornographic.